episode of My Thing Tales for Gangster. We are on a street take. Street take! I am a spaz. So if you didn't know, now you know. Everybody who knows me in real life pretty much knows I'm a spaz and, and um that's just who I am. So get used to it. Cause I ain't going nowhere. I'm here. I'm in here now. So <laughs> In there now, that, that was funny in this show because I was when I was going, I was walking in to go to the Mob King premiere. I'm like, listen, I'm here now. Pulled up in a limo. I pulled up in a limo at the Mob King premiere, Ciro DiPaggio's Mob King premiere. I walk, this is a play, uh, house I'm, uh, in uh, Boca Raton. Um, and I went down there with this guy, and I'm not gonna say his name, but uh, you know, he rented a limo, and I had a, two duffel bags our thing duffel bags one was packed with books one was packed with apparel and i walked into this freaking you know five million dollar house where they were like premiering this this web series and i could walked around handing out all this stuff and that's a funny story because i when i got to the door they the, <laughs> the, the chick working the door you know like the the guest list, you know, it was a nice, there was some paparazzi and stuff, and we pulled up in a limo, we, we're the only ones in a limo, there's a bunch of nice cars and Maseratis and crap there, but we pull up in a limo, we're suited up, I have this girl with me who is a friend, and her friend, um, Jimmy, he passed away, nice guy, and I said, you guys can ride with us, we got a limo, and so we go there, and we're walking up, and there's some people taking pictures and stuff, and I, that's what that you get the, at the end of the video. So we in here now. That's where I was. I guess because like you know, what do you got to say or whatever they said. I'm like, we in here now. So I walk into the door and they were like, uh, who are you? Because there was like kind of a line. I was next in line to get through. And I'm like Gunner, and the chick was this tall blonde chick, with a lot of boobs, and she's like, uh, she's like, oh, I heard about you. She's like, because like, who are you? And I got by the way, my limo driver was was carrying these two duffel bags, like carrying them though. And then my partner was with me, and he's suited up. We both got sunglasses on. So you now we got this driver, like a bodyguard, and then it, it was funny. It was just the way it looked was funny. And she's like, oh, I know who you are. I'm like, yeah, you know me? She's like, oh, yeah, we know who you are. So she's like, yeah, I'm like, these guys are with me. And I pointed to them guys. And so we walk in, there's like a little red carpet area, and they're like meet and greeting, you know. Um, Cyril was there, and they took some pictures of me and Cyril. And, and then there's like Becky and Boca Raton, like radio host or whatever. She was like, and who are you? And I'm holding my book, because I was gonna give her my book. I'm like, I'm like Gunner. And she goes, oh, we know who you are. I'm like, yeah? I'm like, oh. I'm up some kind of, I said, what was, this is what I said. I, I should post this video. I think it's on my YouTube, actually. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta share it. It's funny. Cause I'm like, oh, what the, she was like, we know who you are. You're the one who scared the local police. And I'm like, hell did I do I'm like what was the limo and she's like oh no we heard about you and I didn't know what she meant but it was on a red carpet and I was you know getting interviewed so the people are taking pictures so I'm like yeah I found out later what she meant so what she meant was <laughs> I didn't know this but at when Sierra was promotion promoting this whole event um we had talked on Facebook and I said yeah I'll come down there and you know I'll come down there and give away some shirts and some books and you know whatever you know just BC, part of my marketing, you know, for my book. And he's like, yeah, 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 I gotta come down there. So I go down there. What 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 happens is they had in order to get like a permit or something, in order to have this party at this really exclusive Boca Raton Island. It's on a private island with just ballers. And then the house was nice. It was a four million dollar house probably, but there was like thirty million dollar houses around it, so it was not that big of a deal. Um, and so, anyways, I just got a message, I gotta remember. And so she goes, well, I, what happened was, I guess they called her and said, cause she's like, well, we're gonna be there covering this event, this red carpet event, yada, yada, yada. And, there, and they did like a town hall meeting and said, listen, this freaking party is attracting undesirables is from as far as Detroit. And and then she was like, well, who? She's like, this freaking guy, this ex-mob guy who's on parole, because I was on parole, I had to get permission from my parole officer to even go. 
and basically I said, this is my job. I'm promoting my book and promoting my stuff. I'm going to this party. And he's like, man, and I ran it by the boss. The boss said, yeah, I can't stop him. That's his job. And so I didn't know any of this behind the scenes stuff that again, apparently there was some kind of a town hall meeting and they like, the, the cops were like, eh, but nothing happened because you know, they were like, well, listen, the guy's got permission from the parole officer. He's not coming down here to bother anybody. He's come down here for the party and promote his book or whatever. So that was pretty funny. That's it. That's why the story behind we ain't here now, but um. So it's about time I talk about some Chaldeans, and I got some good Chaldean stories. I am still to this day. I'm not gonna lie. Chaldean stories make me nervous, man. Because Chaldeans, I'm one of those, I'm impressionable, and uh, I had one bad encounter with some Chaldeans, and and I got in a lot of shit over it. So. Just, if you don't know what Chaldeans are, and here's the thing, I'm about to do a show with Johnny Davidge. Johnny Davidge is a is a the vice president and uh, heir apparent to the Powerhouse Gym franchise. So if anybody who doesn't know what Chaldeans are, I mean, you can get Google it or Google you know founders of the Powerhouse Gym Empire. And so his dad was a notorious gangster. I mean, like, his dad was essentially the Chaldean vers version of Jack Toco, the boss of the Italian mafia in Detroit. Um, and there's, there's ranks and size and power and influence was very similar. Uh, it, 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 some of it was different. The type of things they controlled and possessed was a little bit different, but some things were all the same. Gambling was a big thing. Drugs was a good thing. They, could, they basically owned all the liquor stores and, and like probably 90% of the gas stations um, the Chaldeans do in Metro Detroit. That's a very big lucrative operation. A few restaurants, nightclubs, things like that where the, the Italians can control more of the strip clubs, light clubs, restaurants, and the union and stuff. And, but they are so symbiotic and they work together. So the Chaldeans, if they need a favor or muscle, they go to Italians. And if the Italians need a muscle or a favor, they go to Chaldeans. And they like to drink together. They like to eat together. They like to work together. They're very friendly and symbiotic. Basically, in my mind growing up, in my mind, Chaldeans were basically Italians that didn't speak Italian. They look Italian. They, in fact, I mean, so you get a lot of Italians that look like me, that don't really look that ethnic. Um, some more than others. You might get a redhead in Italian, or you might get a blonde or blue-eyed or light-skinned or fair-skinned. You get those, even Sicilians. I'm half Sicilian, and I don't look real ethnic. But the but the Chaldeans, they all look ethnic. They all look Mediterranean. They look like the, the ethnic Italians or Greeks or, or, or Arabs. Um, you know, some Arabs don't look like as much Mediterranean. They look more like you know Arab. But one thing I learned about the Chaldeans, and I was okay. There's two things about first. All the Chaldeans that I knew, essentially all of them had good genetics on the, on the muscle, on the bodybuilding tip. Like they got big, easy, and fast. I was always jealous of that. Like if these freaking guys worked out, uh, man, a fox got splattered right there, that's too bad. And, I, and then the other thing was the women, man. Their women were the freaking hottest women you've ever seen in your life. I mean, just like, I mean, they were just wowee to me, by far. The, the most beautiful woman is these Arabic women. Syrian, Chaldean, you know, Iraqi, whatever. They're all kind of the same, same kind of. Chaldeans are Christian Iraqi. So they're from Iraq, but they're Christian. They have, some of their women are just astoundingly beautiful. And most of their men are good looking too. Like they're real handsome. They, they're very manly and alpha, muscular, wide shouldered, square jawed. And they don't take no shit, man. That's what I love about Chaldeans. You're not gonna go start a fight with a Chaldean in a bar and fight one Chaldean if there's two Chaldeans in the bar. They might not even know each other. They don't even have to know each other. And most of them do though, most of them do. That's funny, I'm on my way here, I passed this turkey with some babies and now I'm on my way back, same turkey with the babies. They, but you start a fight with some Chaldeans, and the other Chaldeans are going to be there. And that's just it. The Albanians were like that too. But there's a lot more Chaldeans in Detroit, in Metro Detroit, than there are Albanians. 
And dude, a lot of people don't like Chaldeans. And I'm gonna tell you why. Like I said, the Chaldeans are usually tend to be very handsome and kind of muscular. They come from money. And because all their families are hard workers, very hard workers, very hard. And bust their ass. They're smart because they use their business savvy to, to, to make them a living. They're not they're not going to factories and getting a job and working some factory job. They're smarter than that. That's for suckers. I mean, that's how you know how they looked at it. No, we'll open a business, a gas station, a restaurant, a, a liquor store. You know, they and, and then they and they would. That's what they do when their families would work. And when the family had enough money to lend their kids money to start their own store or gas station or liquor store, then they would do that. They stick together like any good community, smart community would. That's what smart ethnic communities do. They look out for each other. That's the unfortunate thing when you come to America, when you have this uh, uh, eclectic melting pot of, of like people from Europe, no, like Northern and in, in, in Western Europe, and, and they just don't give a shit about nobody but themselves. You know, there's there's no cultural bond where with the Chaldeans or Italians. And I had somebody on my radio show, some black lady calls in and she's like, why don't you tell all your all those rich Italian people to start putting their money in black banks? Huh? Why don't you do that? I said, yeah, all right, I'll do that. As soon as you tell all your black friends to put all their money in black and, and Italian banks. That sounds absurd, wouldn't it? So you're saying that my rich Italian family and friends need to take their money out of their... The accounts and she's like, why don't they go shop at the black owned businesses? I'm like, here's the thing. If there's a black owned business and a, an Italian owned business and they're Italian, they're supposed to go shop at the black owned business to make you feel better or they're racist because they go to the Italian owned. Of course, the Italians are going to go shop at the Italian owned place. They support their community and their kind the same way blacks should. Blacks should go support their own community in their guy. That's fine. Everybody should do that. But don't say, oh, tell your rich white friends to put their money in the black banks. No. Would your freaking black friends put their money in Italian banks? Hell no. So why even say if something's absurd? I don't hang it up on her. Well, that's like I said. The Chaldeans, they stick together. And they got their shit together. Basically, they, they come from money. Most of them have a fair amount. They're not all rich. Um, but they're comfortable. And they dress nice. And here's the other thing. They, they're a culture of honor and respect, just like the Italians. In some cases, more so than the Italians. When I look at some of these freaking buffoons, like these, these these New York mob groupies and stuff, they're from there. I guess not most of them are really Italian. These mob groupies, or they're, you know, but some of them just they, they're absurd. They worship mob rats. <laughs> they like worship them. I'm like, but like that's something that won't never happen with the Chaldeans. Never, ever. They will never worship some rat, and they will, and they'll deal with their rats. If they get a rat, he's got to go. In fact, I told a story about Brooklyn Mike, a cat from New York, from my neighborhood, a friend of mine that I liked, and the Chaldeans showed me his paperwork that he ratted. And I told Mike, "You got to go. You got to run. They're gonna kill you." And he didn't. I said, "You got any money?" He said, "No." I'm like, "You luck. I like you, bro. I know you just ratted on your dope dealer, freaking, you know, whatever to get out of it. And you didn't rat on us, but still, you're a rat." So here's some money. Get the frick out of here. Go. And I don't want to ever see you again. He didn't say nothing. He took the money. Five racks and ran. And then they caught him in, in prison a couple years later. And they stabbed his eye out. Stabbed him up and stabbed one of his eyes out. But the Chaldeans are the ones who gave me the paperwork. And said, your boy's a freaking rat. And the reason they were they didn't like him. Because Brooklyn Mike hit him with a bottle. Hit one of these Chaldeans with a bottle. And it didn't break but knocked him out. You know, over some girl some big muscle bound Chaldean there's a lot of big muscle bound Chaldeans I just happened to be with Brooklyn Mike he was an Italian kid in New York from Brooklyn so we called him Brooklyn Mike and um, yeah, I don't know there were some words between him and this dude at a strip club and, and when we were leaving we were about to leave and no big deal and the guy said something, something slick to, to Mike and Mike freaking grabbed the champagne bottle off the thing and freaking bam and cracked him across the, right here in the forehead and knocked the guy out and then a year later, I ended up getting in a knife fight because of that same thing. Because some more Chaldeans saw me walking out of the club by myself. And then one of them, who wasn't a Chaldean, pulled a knife on me. And I ended up getting in a knife fight and got stabbed. But um, moral of the story is these are guys that come, uh, they're very, you know, like, their culture is, is dictated and ran with honor and integrity, Chaldeans. 
So I've always had the highest level of respect for them. And generally, I got along really well with them. Like, they're funny as hell. They got the same type of personalities and senses of humor um, that I did. So, like, when I was with them, it was like being with, like, one of my cousins or, like, a brother or something. They're just funny. And, dude, like, they won't let you pay for a drink. You know, if you're with them and you're, and you're out there with a the drink, they're paying for your drinks. They're paying for your food. You know, they're just they're, they're gentlemen. They're, they're men of honor and gentlemen. And like the way they are raised is to be respectful and have integrity and have honor. And so if they get pinched, they don't rat. That's why you don't hear nothing about no Chaldean rats. I'm sure there are some, I'm, I'm sure there are, but you don't hear much about them because they're just not. They deal with family almost exclusively, kind of similar to the way the Italian mafia does. So they have their family units, their structure. It's structured, they're, you know, it's a Chaldean mafia. And it's structured just like, a regular mafia fan with a boss, an underboss, a consigliere, a street boss, the capos, the whole nine. And they're about the same size as, or at least they were. I can't say now what they're like now. But back in the day, they were structured a lot like uh, about the same size of, of Detroit mafia. But sometimes the Chaldeans would have issues with certain bookies or, or betters who were like to pretend they were connected and wouldn't pay the Chaldean bookies. Not knowing that the Chaldean bookie was laying off bets with, I'm not gonna say their names, but Italian, Italian Sicilian bookies who are under Tony Jack. So what would happen is, big bettors would, you know, bet 20, 30, $50,000 to the Chaldeans and say, F you, basically, I'm not paying or going to hiding or whatever because they're just Chaldeans, they're not the Mafia. But the Chaldeans were like, well, these guy, the guy who owes me, owes me the money is kind of connected to one of the Italians or some of the Italians, he's a cousin or he's a nephew, he's whatever. So they can't just go after him because they can handle their own, they know how to collect money. But they're not gonna go after a guy who's a connected guy and, and hurt him or threaten him without running it by somebody in the Italians. So when that happened, when I was around, I'd get a call from Tony. And Tony would say, listen, go see so-and-so and you tell them that they got to pay their marker. You tell them the guy they booked the bet with is with me. So that means them not paying the Chaldean means they're not paying me and tell him, me, Tony Jack's got a problem with that. So I would go do it, and they never had a problem. As soon as I'd say that, they would pay. I mean, as soon as I'd say that, they're like, oh, oh, oh my bad, yeah, listen, give me, I got, just give me one day or so, I gotta run around, move some money, I gotta go to the bank, I gotta, whatever. sometimes I'd be like, if Tony said, get the money today, don't come back without the money, or you don't get paid, I'd say, listen, we need to get this money right freaking now. What do we gotta do? I don't care if we gotta sell the house. we we'll get the freaking money. And they always got the money. They had the money. They'd always get the money. They robbed Peter to pay Paul. I can't even think of one instance, not one, where in that situation, someone told me to F off. And really, in all the years they did that, which is 10 years, there no, only like three times that I had to freaking hurt, hurt a guy. Only three times. And I know all three, I can remember all three times. Two times a guy told me to F off. And one time... A guy said, "Meet him back in this this bar," and then I came, and then he, I came back, and he had some bikers with him, and then he told me to f off. So then I grabbed the baseball bat and came in and freaking smashed him with the bat. A couple of these guys with bats. I didn't, I didn't like split their heads open and crap like that. I did maybe a little bit, but I broke more like broke arms and, and ribs with the bat because I wasn't trying to kill him and you know, get a case. But anyways, the other two guys basically said f off. You know, who are you? And I told them, they like, I don't give a shit. I don't I'll pay when I'm ready or whatever. I said, okay. And I freaking smashed their freaking teeth in and beat the shit out of them. And so I, you know, now I'll be back next time. And I said, the next guy that comes for the money, he ain't going to freaking beat your ass. You got that? It ain't going to be a beat. It's going to be this. So they always paid. Always paid. But anyways, this one time... <laughs> Which is actually a funny story, I've been meaning to tell it. 
And the whole reason I'm telling this whole story to begin with is the fact that I'm having Johnny Dabich on. And Johnny Dabich is an OG kid. He's not a kid. He's in his 30s. Real good looking, six foot five, muscle bound, freaking super nice guy. Super respectful. Super man of honor. Basically, like, I'm sure if I would have known him in the street before I went to prison, he probably would have been my best freaking friend. You can tell. He's just a good dude. We think the same. We act the same. He's smarter than me in terms of, like, business and, like, you know, things like that. He's way smarter than me. He, he, he's got, he got it from his dad. You know, his dad started the powerhouse gyms. They, they built a freaking empire that's worth $500 million or whatever. You know, the guy's a baller. And now he's the vice president. He helps manage it with his uncle, which was his father's brother, Will. They were talking about Will Dabbage. Um, and so, and now, by the way, Johnny's brother's in prison right now for something he didn't even do. Pretty much got him framed up in there for something he didn't even do. I was in prison with him. That's how I know the dude. I was I was locked. I was in two different prison with the guy, and I was. Uh, he's a. He was a really quiet, big guy. Another big guy, six foot five, six four, six five. I don't know. Big guy, you know, like 350, 370 pound dude. The, the Mobites, the Mobites, the freaking you know the racist black nation of Islam Mobites tried to extort him, and uh, I guess he beat the shit out of one of them. They tried to go at him when he was in the shower, and he's getting out of the shower naked. And he snatched him up and pulled him in. He's not a big freaking dude, man. And he, these guys are not punks, man. They ain't no punks. I mean, they're, they're tough guys and fighters. And if, dude, you got a six foot five guy who's 370 pounds, who's a fighter or not afraid to fight, will beat your ass. Dude, I'm sure, I can only imagine that. Because most of them Mobites are straight cut pussy. They're just like big for nothing, muscle bound pussies. I know, I was in prison with him for 13 years. I didn't get a scratch. You know why? F them. I told them all to eat a dick. And whenever I whenever I wanted, I'd, like, I'd act like, you know, I'd act like whatever. And they didn't do dick because they're all pussies. They all came up on the street, thought they were tough because they had a gun. They went to prison, started working out and eating like a human being. And they freaking blew up. Now they're walking around all huge. That don't make you tough. It means you're just a freaking been protected. You've been in a protected environment your whole life. You're a punk and a pussy. And I mean, I let them know that. Fake ass nation of Islam. They're a freaking joke. And, um... So they tried to get his brother, but I talked to his brother, you know, several times. He was a quiet guy, and I could tell he didn't he didn't really have much of an interest in talking to me. I never told him I was a toko and that I was connected and all that. I just didn't think he'd care, and I didn't think it was. This is not something you talk about. It's just not. It's not one of those things. You go, hey, by the way, man, I know you're a dad, but you know I'm a toko. Let's talk mob stuff or gangster stuff. He just was friendly and, and nice to me, and that was it. I felt bad. Because when I when I heard he went to the hole, because the freaking Mobites tried to squeeze him, I knew what happened. They're like, oh, this mother effer's got mad loot. We're going to extort him. But he basically told them to F off and beat one of their asses in the shower, and that was that. But after that, I think they tried to come at him and stab him or whatever. And so he just kind of, I don't know if he went to the hole and got stabbed. I don't remember. But anyway, that's the point of me, what I'm telling you all this is because I'm having him on. His dad, Johnny Dabbage's dad, Norm Dabbage was like an OG gangster, a legend. I didn't really know the dude, you know. I don't even know, I can't even remember if I ever saw the guy, but I knew who he was. I heard it, uh, heard his name a lot. So, you know, like, I knew I knew Dabbage's, I knew the name. It was very prominent, popular. There was a rabbit in the road, I want to hit it. Oh, baby rabbit, Oh, so cute, little baby rabbit. But um, I did have one Dabbage story where I, I told the story how I was working at a gym kind of part-time once a week. I'd go in there to train people and they'd give me a free membership in exchange. And um, so I brought some steroids in there to sell to these cops, these dirty cops, this dirty cop. Um, and then the cop comes in to buy him. He's like, oh, he got looked all nervous and got shady. And he was all like, oh, I don't know. I think I'm going to hold off. on So I thought the cops were there. To, like, I thought they might be out there to bust me or whatever. So I hid the steroids in the linen closet in the locker room. And then like the cleanup kid found him. And when he found them, he went and told the freaking owner. And this guy named George, uh, that's all I knew. I thought his name, I thought he was George Dabbage. And um, and then what's just the funny part is, he's not, his real name's not even George. Just what Johnny tells me yesterday on the phone. He's like, yeah, I know that guy. His name is George something or another. He's not, his real name is this, but he likes to tell everybody his name is George Dabbage. He's like, I don't really like him. He's kind of an asshole, you know, or, or whatever. You know, maybe they say he's kind of an asshole. He's like, ah, he's, just, he's one of those guys. 
a lot of people like to throw the Davich name out there, but there's not a lot. Like if they're cousins or have the Davich name, but there's a ton of like Chaldean kids out there who like may use the name Davich. Maybe they're not really like part of the real Davich family. Kind of like Toko with my name. There's a million freaking Tokos and there's a million cousins and stuff. And about 90% of them aren't really connected. They're just kind of cousins and whatever. They might, you know, most of them are normal, live normal life. They're not criminals, you know what I'm saying? Like the Davidge family, 99% of them are just legitimate businessmen, you know, own stores or run the powerhouse gyms or whatever the case. But Johnny is now the vice president and runs this company and he's, you know, a hardworking kid. I'm going to say kid, he looks young, but he's, he's not. I know he's in his 30s. Um, but he's just a really nice kid, man. A nice guy. But no, not a punk. He's done time. He's done, he's done a couple stints in prison and jail and and he's, he's no punk you know he, he, he ain't the kind of guy he told me a funny story about some somebody tried to extort him in the county jail open county jail and he ended up grabbing a sandwich and grabbing him by the face and smash it well, some black dudes i was gonna extort him he said like, yeah give me a sandwich on sandwich day and he's like I, I got you man no problem you can get it and the guy comes over he's like what? he's like got my sandwich he's like, yeah i got your sandwich this is good he goes like, just grab <laughs> smash and beat his ass then beat him up this is a six foot five muscle bound muscle bound dude too I mean he ain't no punk but um anyways like the one funny story that I got that got me in trouble with Chaldeans is um when and typically I was I was friendly with Chaldeans I had a bunch of Chaldean friends I wish I could remember all their names man you know I just kind of knew them from nightclubs knew them from around the way here and there like like you know I was friends with a cat named Simon and he introduced me to all of them you know and I they, and you know, I'd only see them and hang out with them when I was in nightclubs and strip clubs or whatever. So I don't really remember their names well. I just remember being around them. They're always funny. They always had money. Always were like really warm towards me. Simon was extra warm towards me. And there, there's other ones too. I just don't want to say their names because, you know, I don't know what they're doing right now. <laughs> That's the thing is, and if I bring them up and make reference to what they were doing at the time, it could not, it may not bode well for what they're doing now. So I just, you know, I don't know. They got families, careers, you know, businesses. I'm not going to put them on blast. But they had these two Chaldean bookies, right? So I had this friend of mine who used to get bike parts, motorcycle parts at this place called Al Gaskell's. And um, it's a motorcycle shop on Nine Mile. And, and he's like, I got these guys that give me discounts on all this stuff. So I'm going to send you in here to get stuff for your motorcycle, like parts for my dirt bike and crap. And I'm like... I'm like, ah, oh, cool, cool, cool. So I go in there and start dealing with these guys, and they're like, give me good deals, man, good deals. They they manage the parts department, which is a whole separate building from the like the new motorcycle department where they sell the motorcycles, like a showroom and all. And so it's just this one little building next door, this blue building, and um, and I go in there, and they those guys thought I was they thought I was a freaking lunatic, man. I was, I mean, it was so funny. I would, I would go in there and just. My friend called me White Debo. My my uh, my friend Brian, who hooked me up, introduced me to these guys because they thought I, he thought I was a freaking lunatic. And so one day, I ordered my parts, and I ordered these parts, and I came in there one day. I know there's got to be some deer out there. It's hot in here, man. I should just turn my AC on, man. Why didn't I think of that? It's hot. So one day. I order my parts, about a week goes by, I go in there, they're not there. So the next day I come in there, and this is when they had started calling me like White Debo, just because I was funny. Um, I did take a helmet one time. I walked in there, they had helmets, new helmets for sale. And I said, yo, you guys, what can you give me, a, like one of these new helmets? I got a Ninja, you know, I had a Ninja. I go up there, I had a dirt bike and a Ninja. I was getting the parts for the dirt bike though. I had bought parts for my Ninja there too. For I bought a Yoshimura pipe and a jet carb kit. And those guys gave it to me like freaking almost nothing. In fact, they gave me some stuff for nothing. Because what they say is they order stuff and if the customer doesn't come and pick it up, then like if we don't ship it back, like this kind of goes in the inventory in the back. We have all the stuff back there. And then at the end of the year, we just kind of like we literally throw stuff out because we don't have room. It's like, I'll just order your pipe and your kit and just you can have it. I'm like, dude. Four hundred dollars, bro. Thank you. And they were super cool about it. But then I ordered this whole kit to get my dirt bike all turn it on black because it was red and white, and I wanted to make it like black and chrome. My dirt bike to match my ninja. And so I ordered all this stuff, and I'm, you know, I'm like, "Where is it?" And then they come in. The next time I come in, and they got a glass display thing in the front on the counter. So when you walk in, 
and there's a it's a glass thing and it's like it's angled in the front and I, I may have told this story before if I have I apologize but I walked up I'm like what's up fools and and I like what's up fool Debo wanted his parts and I slammed my hand down on this book there was like a parts like a, a parts catalog you know you know on, on the sitting on the glass top I didn't even slam my hand on it that hard I was just like what's up fools Debo wanted his parts and when I did that, boom, it shattered. And when it shattered, like everything on there, because there was some parts and like there was stuff on top of it, little boxes with parts. And it, whatever, it shattered and then fell through the front and shattered the front. So the whole thing, and I was high as hell. I just smoked a joint before I got, I mean, I smoked a joint on the way there. So I probably like took my last hit like maybe two minutes before and I walked in there high. So I'm being funny. I'm like, I come walking out stone. I'm like, what's that fool? What Debo wanted to talk? What Debo Everything shattered. All you hear was crash, crash, crash. The whole thing, the whole display case, top and front shattered and exploded glass everywhere. Dude, you know, the same deer every day it's sitting out in the field eating all by itself i know he's got i know it's got a doe i mean i know it's got a fawn there's a fawn around here somewhere she's got that fawn hidden and she's just looking at me eating. she don't even care oh it's a button buck it's a little buck it's a little baby buck hey there oh, oh buddy cute little deer um so i mean these guys i i know they think i'm a i'm a freaking an absolute idiot because of this but i i start laughing so hard when i did this and that's kind of a douchey thing to do because uh, i just destroyed their entire like big 10 foot long counter you know i just bust out laughing because it was so funny the way i did it and it was an accident so uh, i mean it was just like people want to stop <laughs> and it just i don't know in my mind because i was high i just imagined what it must have looked like you know from to an outsider and there was somebody in the store too there was somebody in there because they had racks with like b biker coats and stuff like that and like stuck clothing for dirt biking and like helmets and stuff like that and like when i did that i just imagined that the guy over there watching this must have been like what the f and i burst out laughing so hard and my buddy my buddy jay kane r.i.p jay kane he was with me too we drove there together on a cross rocket that's what it was we smoked the joint at Jay's house, which is like two miles away, I'm um, off of um, Frazo and Frazo and Gratiot area, and this is at like nine in Gratiot. It's a mile and a half away. So we jumped on our crotch rockets after we smoked the joint, and we were there. Which obviously, on the crotch rockets, we could get there in like two minutes, and we were there. So and Jay walked in, like was walking in behind me when I did that, and I dying laughing. I'm laughing so freaking hard, and I can't even. I'm not even, no sound coming out. I'm like. And Jay, I look at like Jay, he's the same way. Like It was like slow motion, it was so funny, man. Neither one of us were like even laughing out loud. We were just crying, laughing. These poor two dudes, and they're they're smiling behind the counter, these two Chaldean kids, but they but they weren't they weren't laughing like us. But they, they were just like smiling, because they, they were like smiling at us laughing. How can you not smile at least when you're looking at two idiots laughing that hard? I mean, it don't matter what's so funny. They're like, this. it's funny. So I turn around and I left, just walked right out. I couldn't do it. I couldn't face these guys. I, I, I felt bad. I, I just, I just turned around and walked out. And I called them like 20 minutes later, and I called them like, "Listen, guys, dude, I apologize, man. If I gotta pay for that, I will. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, dude. I, I didn't mean that, bro. I'm all high. I walk in there. I didn't even mean that. And they're like, nah, "Relax, bro. It's all good, dude. Just, I mean, I'm like, you're not getting in trouble. He's like, "No, nah, I just tell the boss. Freaking, we dropped the part on it and it broke. No big deal. It's no big deal." For some reason, in my I got it in my head that they were going to get in a bunch of trouble over it. I, I don't know why, but it's just what I what I was thinking. So, anyways, the one kid starts telling me. So I noticed he's got a nice red BMW. Not the kid, and I'm like, I mean, you got a freaking nice car for a kid who works in a parts in the parts department of freaking Al Gaskell's. And his boy kind of looks at him and smiles. And I'm like, what the frick's that smile about? What you got? What you boys up to, man? What you doing in here? He's like, what? He was like, oh, no, no, why? You, you, you like, to, you know, you like the bet? I said, what you mean? Oh, I like the bet. I said, no, nah, man, I like the house. He's like, oh, you like the house? I said, yeah. 
I said, so what you doing? He's like, oh, I might take a bet here and there. I'm like, who are you betting with? Like, who's the layoff bookie? He's like, no, we don't use a layoff bookie. How you freaking, how you balancing the book? He's like, we just take all bets, win or lose. So I'm like, so you don't use a layoff bookie to balance? And he's like, nah, nah. If we lose, we just get behind the, you know, behind the freaking eight ball. But we win, we're pretty good. We get balance, We try to balance it all up, and we do pretty good. I'm like, how much you betting, man? And at first, they like, well, the first time he told me, he was like, eh, I'm not doing that much. Like eight thousand a week or something. Like, that ain't even worth bugging. But then that's not even worth, you know, the juice on that's like eight hundred bucks if you balance it. If you win, then you can make a lot more. But if you lose, you're gonna lose a lot more. Only a sucker does that. That's why you lose. You use layoff bookies. My grandfather was a huge layoff bookie. Um, and um, Freddie Salem, Al Hilf, those guys were layoff bookies. There are some other big Keldean layoff bookies. And I asked them, like, you know, so and so, you know, so and so. And they're like, I mean, I, they're like, I know who he is. We know who he is. I'm like, you're not laying off with him. No, nah, I don't really. You know, we don't even really know the guy, but we know who he is. So I come back. I'm like, dude, you guys got to make. You got to start laying off your bets, man. I didn't even say, you know, if the Italians, you know, find out, because I don't even think they knew who I was or I was connected or nothing. I didn't want to put it out there. I, it's not how we operate. It's not how we operate. We just don't put it out. Oh, by the way, I'm in the mafia or I'm with the mafia. So you need to know. I never would say that. Never. Nobody would know. But when he started telling me about this betting, and then I said, who, who, who like, got any good bet, big betters? And he said, so-and-so. And I knew this one dude who was betting with him. I'm like, yo, that's one of our betters. Like, that dude there is a freaking heavyweight better. I mean, he probably bets, you know, up to 20 Gs a week. That's a freaking pretty heavy, heavy better. You know what I'm saying? I knew the guy. I'm picturing him right in my mind. He's this tall, nerdy dude. He's real quiet. Would never look you in the eye. When he talked to you, he, you know, he's looked like this. He wouldn't look you in the eye. A little cheesy mustache, like a Hitler mustache. I don't know why he wouldn't look you in the eye. He was a good, good enough dude, but he also sold weed. That's how I knew the guy. He's a, he's a weed dealer, big weed dealer. And so that's how I knew him, but I knew he'd bet. He bet he would bet with some of these bookies that I know. In fact, I hooked him up with the bookies. I'm the one I hooked him up with the bookies. So that's how I knew. And now he's betting with these freaking kids. And I'm like, you know, what are you shaving points? And they were he's shaving points, you know, spread six that go six and a half or five and a half or whatever it was. You know, they, they know what to do. They were shaving. They were shaving points, giving a better payout. I'm like, all right. So I come back, I don't know, not that long ago, maybe a month later, and I said, we're going to talk. And I like the guys. They were mad cool. They were super funny. I, I was in the neighborhood all the time, so I'd pop in on my Ninja. I stole a helmet from him one time, right in front of him. I had an older helmet that wasn't that great. You know, and I wanted one of these brand new, badass, like $400 ones, but I wasn't paying for it. I'm, like, I'm not paying 400 bucks for a helmet. That's freaking straight stupid, man. It just, I wouldn't do it. it just could, I couldn't bring myself to do it. So I was, again, all high one day, and I'm walking out of the store, and I basically took my helmet, walked over to the shelf. I pulled a nice brand new four hundred one dollar one off, put it on my head, put the other one, my old one, on the shelf. Turned around and walked out. They never said nothing. They didn't care. They were cool, man. They were mad cool. And I like to go in there and hang out, get high, and like just be funny, man. Smoke some weed and just go in there and be silly with these guys. You know, they were they were like, I, I wish I could, I wish I could like get them on the camera because their personalities were really good. They were like, funny. There was like, there were two of them and they fed off each other. One was like, like, like a half-ass wise guy, smart ass, kind of cocky, the kid with the BMW. And the other guy was like a more quiet, kind of really witty, pragmatic kind of guy. And they were like, no, I think they were cousins, but they were also best friends and they worked together. So they just fed off each other really well. So, and then I like knew, could figure, I, you know, being around Chaldeans and Italians, I, I kind of fed, like their personalities really went well with mine. So we'd laugh, whatever. And finally, I, and I said, man, how much you guys booking, man? And the dude's like, you know, I don't know. I pretty, what did we do last week? And he's like, I don't, know, I don't think we did like 110, but the week before we did only like 80. And I'm like, wait a minute, you booked 110 G's last, last, last week? And 80 the week before, so you got your averaging like, you know, 95. And they're like, yeah, pretty close. I'm like, dude, you're balancing? And he's like, yeah, we're doing pretty good, you know, for the most part. And they must have had been. They, I have a feeling they were lying to me about who they're. There's no way they could not balance and, and push on layoffs. There's just no way. You're not going to get that lucky. And you know, nobody's going to bet with the spread the exact same amount you're going to bet against. So somebody's either winning or losing all the time. Maybe they got lucky and they won a bunch, didn't care about losing, but whatever. And I finally was like, bro, that's, that's, that's a freaking, you know, that's, you know, 10%. That's like 10 G's a week for, and, you know, they're, they're banking. 
I'm like, nah, man. And I, and I got real serious. I'm like, you know what, bro? You guys got to pay. And I broke down the whole thing, the whole infrastructure. But I did say, listen, the reason you do this is you push layoff bets with my guys, all right? My guy. And you pay us, you know, 10% of your 10% juice every week, all right? Which would be a thousand bucks paying me. And you lay off that that was my that was my cut in the game would say, listen, you're gonna give me ten percent of your of the vig every week, you know, the juice. And then you're gonna push all your layoff bets on this guy. And so the, I explained it real detailed and said, This is how it works, bro. I said, But the thing is, if you get in trouble, if you get pinched, or if somebody's like investigating you, we'll know. Like if you're under investigation, we will know long before you're ever arrested or investigated and we can get you out of it. We'll find a way to get you out of it. They got prosecutors, they got judges, they got lawyers, they got investigators, they got cops on the inside. So that's the benefit of like working with us. You're not ever going to get busted if you stick to just betting this way. And if you lay off your bets with these guys or this one particular guy I said, then you're protected. You're good. You're always going to you know. So if you're 20,000 with or against or whatever you got, Book it that way with this guy and you're safe. You're good, right? Um, if you have problems with collections, you know, let me know. I go get the money. You know, if you have problems with you know, another bookie or, or somebody that's middlemanning or anything like that, let me know. And I'm laying this out to them and they're all, they're listening to me because I kind of I became friends with the guys. So I'm basically telling them from now on, anything, you're off, like your layoff bets got to go to this freaking mob, dude. And, and you got to give me a thousand bucks a week. It was a soft shakedown. I mean, and they were like, you know, they're naive kids. They were young, man. They were like 21 years old. They were young kids, maybe 22, 23 at the most. And they were just sat there listening to me. And they already thought I was a freaking lunatic. I mean, they thought I was a straight cut maniac. And I just told them, you're going to pay me a thousand bucks a week and push all your layoff bets. Meaning layoff bets, you got to balance your book. If you get 20,000 with the spread, you need 20,000 against the spread. If you don't have 20,000 against the spread and the win, the, the with uh, wins, then you got to cover the loss. So what you do is try to balance your book. And anything that's above or out of balance, you take this out of balance and you give it to another book. You got a layoff bookie or a, a layover bookie. And then those guys balance them up and then they give what they can't spend over to Vegas. And Vegas balances it up. So... Because they can, Vegas can afford to lose if they lose a freaking big buck and they lose $30 million in one day. It's nothing because they make freaking $60 million back tomorrow. Um, So they're just like, you know, typical, you know, just typical dumb kids. They're like, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to work with us. You got me. Okay, cool, cool. I'm like, yeah, I'll come in every Friday. Or no, I think I said I'd come in every Monday. Usually it was after the weekend because that's when the you know, football and you know, those basketball games all the time, but football was the big thing. So I was like, I'll come in every Monday, probably maybe Tuesday, whatever day it was. And I'll just like, I'll get my cut, you know, give me a G, you know, you know, be honest, you know, if you, if you only book freaking 70 grand, all right, give me 700, you know, if you book 150, I, I want 1500, you know, I'm going to know because I know you're better. I'm just asking around. I'm going to know some of your betters. I'm going to know. If you're lying to me, then I'll fight fine now. So, you know, I do this for a while. And, and it worked out pretty good um, for about a couple of months. And then I get a call and and it's Tony. And he says, because again, I was real young. And Tony says, man, you've been freaking shaking down these freaking Chaldean kids. I'm like. Not shake them down, just freaking kind of, I guess. Why? What's up? He's like, you know, tells me the name of the Chaldean guy. He's like, you know, a friend of mine, one of the Chaldeans, said a friend of his came to him and said that you, who, by the way, I didn't even know you were talking about you. You know, he said Al, but I didn't know. And then, you know, they described you and said, you know, who you are and where you're from. And I, like, this is my guy. This is, you know, not saying he's, I'm his guy, but he put two and two together pretty quickly. And he says, yeah, he's been freaking shaking down these Chaldean kids. They kind of just, they don't, they don't want to be shaken down anymore. So they they rather, you know, um, pay uh, their layoff bets to a Chaldean bookie. And they'd rather pay the Cal be paid to be with the Chaldean. Basically, they're going to do the same thing, but they're not going to pay the Chaldean. They're not going to pay me. They're going to pay the Chaldean. And so now... 
I'm like, what the frick? That's some bullshit. They're going to be paying the same thing that a Chaldean guy. And they're going to pay the layoff bookie. He's like, in the end, Alonzo, the layoff bookie is my guy. So it's the same thing. So basically, I'm the only one who gets dicked here. Is what I said. I said, I said, I, now I'm mad. I felt like I should go knock these motherfuckers' heads off. You know what I'm saying? Because now he's like, well, what would you do? What would you do if it was you? Would you rather give you the money or give their, the, the Chaldean, their uncle, was who it was, it was an uncle, give the, their uncle the money? And I'm like, yeah, I get that, man. But these are kind of, like, I'm friends with these guys. And they're not that good of friends. You're shaking them down for a thousand bucks a week, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, you know. And that just irritated the shit out of me because that was like an easy score every week, seven, eight hundred bucks, thousand bucks every week. And it, it seemed like everything I did in life, no matter what I did, I somehow found a way to lose it or screw it up. So even if I had a little good thing going, a little money, uh, free money this way, a little extra money that way, that it always ended quickly because some other greedy mother effort would dick me or get step on my toes or whatever. And then so the Chaldean that that the uncle. I see that the uncle one time, I'm coming out of this place on Harper, this restaurant, or not restaurant, excuse me, like bakery slash deli. And I I'd let him have it. I said, you know, basically say, you mother effing, mother effing piece of, da -da 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 -da. You, you dick me out of my money. I said, for what? You don't, you weren't doing nothing. You don't do nothing. You're not going to do nothing. I'm like, this is all us. I gave them a layoff bookie. And what? Now, now I gave them the layoff bookie so they can balance the book. I gave them protection. I gave them, you know, help and all this stuff. Now you're going to claim it. And then they're still going to use the same layoff bookie that gets Tony paid. You're just going to get the money that I earned, basically. So the money I earned or, or you know, you don't earn money in the shakedown, but I'm the one who was helping him and, you know, protecting him. So nobody else like me came along and all this. And in the end, the guy, he, you know, he gets tough with me. I mother F him. He mother F me. I mother F him. I'm starting to kick his ass. Da, 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 da. Yeah. I get another call. There's Tony again. He says, what's wrong with you, man? What the F is wrong with you, man? This guy, he's, you know, he's a friend of the family. You know, he's, he's friends with this guy. And I'm like, because I, I said, Tony, do you know this dude? He's like, I don't know him personally, but he's friends with this guy. I was like, who gives a shit? Well, that guy's a friend of mine, and he called me complaining and said, you've started to kick his ass, and blah, 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 blah. And now he's worried he's going to have a problem with you. He's worried about these kids. He's worried you're going to go freaking hurt these kids. And blah, blah, blah. So listen, let it go. I'm like, you know, what? but, 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 but. I said, but, I, I, I want my money back. But, but, let it go. So in the end, all I could do was let it go. There it goes. And then on top of it, like, oh, man. What really pissed me off is I liked the kids. I enjoyed them. I enjoyed being around them. I thought they were funny or fun to be around. And uh, now I never went and never saw them. I don't think I ever saw them again. I don't think I ever saw them again. Never. I don't think I saw them at a nightclub, restaurant, never. I never went in the Gaskells again. Nothing. I just, because I knew if I go see them, I want to smack them. I'm like, these punk ass kids. You know, I, I I sold them on the whole shakedown. Like, yeah, I'm helping you do you a favor. And then they basically screwed me and gave their uncle the money that they were giving me to make me go away. That's what they did, essentially. They essentially took the money they were giving me when I offered to help them and, you know, help them keep in line and gave it to their uncle and said, make this guy go away. And and, and it worked. I had to go away because they, they went the back door. They took the back war door to a friend of a friend of Tony, and Tony was gave me the order to back off, and I, and I did. Anyways, typical story. Of the, typical, I'm, I'm not faulting them. I guess I would have done the same thing, but it was irritating in, in my in my book. <laughs> but again, I wasn't really gonna. I, I wasn't gonna like. I wasn't gonna go hurt the kids. And I just I was more annoyed by the whole thing, with the fact that like, man, these freaking kids basically backdoored me and made me, you know, out to be an asshole. At the end of the day. What I'm getting at is Chaldeans need to be played with, all right? They're serious business, and they're gangsters, and they're they're good people. Um, I got a lot of love for them. I got a lot more love for Chaldeans than basically any other uh, uh, ethnicity other than Italians. Um, and really, I mean, I have just as much respect for them as I do Italians. Um, so anyone can judge me for that. I can You can kiss my ass. Unless you know Chaldeans, you don't know Dick. If not, you've been around them, you're going to respect them and as much as you can respect them. That's the thing. I, I've been around them. I know them. Um, so they're good people. And I am looking forward very much to having Johnny Dabich on and getting to know him and um, the black cat walking down my road. I'm going to have some good luck. 
and get into hear his story. His story, he's got a crazy ass story. He's got good stories too, and he's good at telling them. He's got some good crazy ass stories from jail and and just in life, man. The dude's been through some crap. Dude, they had a thirty five thousand square foot house, thirty five thousand square foot house on a lake, and the the, the IRS came and took it away. It said, pack up, get out right now. Thirty five thousand. You know how big that is. That's like 10 times bigger than like the biggest house you've probably ever been in. I mean, it's crazy. 35,000 square foot. You get lost in that like for, for two days. And, and they took it and said, get out. And they took all their money and everything. They do the IRS, the feds, and everybody. They hate the damages. They hate them, Chaldeans. Hate them. They tried. Lou, I won't go. Uh, Lou Crowley. I'm not going to get into his story um, unless somebody else wants to get into it, like Scott or something. But they, the, when they passed the law, I think it was, I think it was Donald Trump. That the, to um to ex to deport these uh potential um the deport I can't remember what it was but the first person on the list number one person on the list was Lou Crowley they were gonna deport this guy out of the second he got out of prison they like he, like he, they met him at the freaking and said here you go pick him up you're on a plane you're out out of here they just they, these guys were gangsters and they didn't want him in America. But, you know, that's a story for Scott to tell or maybe Johnny. For now, that's another one in the books. Um, God bless. I'll, I'll publish this show. That was not me farting. That was my my air conditioner does that. That does a weird... So, I'll be back. That's another episode of books. Make sure you like this video. If you got this far in the video, just like it. It takes one second. One. One second. Beep, and it helps boost the algorithm and it changes the game. And that makes it more visible. And when it makes it more visible, I get more likes and more views and it helps me make money. Ultimately, the goal is to sell my books, to be a king, volume one and two, which, by the way, has perfect five star reviews. I say it all the time. I'm up to about 100 five stars right now in volume, both volumes. And um, check it out, man. The books are being called the next Godfather. That's all I can say. I mean, what better compliment can a, can a writer get when you write the mafia? John Winston says, dude, you wrote the Godfather of our generation. You know what I mean? And it's right there. What, like all the reviews, boom, 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 a hundred times over. Like this guy's the truth. So check it out. If you like to read like a good book, a good mafia book, um, read it. Take the, take the money. It's 20 freaking bucks. And again, if you can't afford $20 to read a good book, then we probably can't be friends because I wouldn't want to be friends with anyone who can't read. I'm not saying if you don't like to read, it's no big deal, whatever. But if you are someone who would like to read a good mafia book, but you're like, yeah, I just don't have $20. I'm like, you're definitely not doing something right in life and you need to privately message me and we need to work on something together to help you learn how to, you know, make some freaking money. Same thing with the apparel, our thing apparel. We got the dope stuff, you know, custom made your city. We got everything. Uh, it's 30 bucks for one of these shirts. If you can't, I mean, I know you wear, wear clothes. You got to go shopping. You buy clothes every every year or every, every summer or spring or fall. Um, if you can't afford a $25, $30 t-shirt or $30 shirt like this, then uh, you need to work on your money game and get right. Because we got dope and we got the best stuff around. And like I said, all the trolls and the YouTube trolls and the wannabes and the groupies. And they're like, oh, Gunner is nobody. You know, I'm like, uh, did you buy my book? No. Did you buy my shirt? No. Okay, good. Say whatever you want. Next. Who's next? I can care less what you say. You're no factor. Non-factor. You can't afford a shirt or a book and you have no bearing in my life. I'm about to get out of my car, go have dinner. Probably going to barbecue something. It's a nice evening. Sun setting. Mommy, beautiful property. Trolls continue to troll. By all means, comment, hate me, whatever you want. It, it all boosts the algorithm so I can sell. Because when it does, new people, every day I get like 10, 20, 30 new subscribers. And those new people, they don't care about the freaking, they're not groupies. They didn't care less. And when I get, and then they go, oh, this guy's got a book. Here, let me check out the reviews. Holy crap, the reviews on this book are amazing. I gotta check this freaking book out. Bing, I got a reader. Or like, oh, it's got a clothing line too? Let me check that out. You know what all this is? All these are. All these are orders that I gotta ship. I gotta package them all up. I just came from the printer, and that's what I'm about to do. Package them up, and I'll take them. Just like I am right now. Yeah, boom.
We in here now. <laughs>